Well, probably ought to get started. Uh, as you could tell, my name is Todd Hatfield with HECO Industrial Service Groups. I'm uh, Vice President of Engineering and Repair. Been involved with the company from the time that about 1980 all the way to now. Graduated from college in 1985, electrical engineering. Uh, from that point, I was involved. We had a coil manufacturing division, HECO Coil. Was involved with that, managing that and managing uh, the uh, repair facility and doing engineering. So kind of had did a lot of things over a period of time. Um, but my background primarily now is repairing, solving problematic motor designs, improving motor designs, uh, giving customers ideas on how to take a problematic motor and make it better and most of the time being able to do that with the existing motor. Common failure types, well, th this is close to the breakdown of where failures occur. On most motors, you're gonna have about 50% uh, attributable to bearing failures. You're gonna have about 16. This is argumentum. You can say 16 to 20, you might say 45 to 55, but th this is relatively accurate. External conditions, about 16%. Some of the things we've talked about. Unknown, there's an unknown category where you can't figure it out, about 10. Rotor bar is somewhere in the five to maybe seven, just depending on the application, percent range and shaft and coupling. Induction motors will operate under the most adverse conditions and they'll keep trying to operate, uh, but those conditions are usually preventable and unfortunately, the fact that they're preventable, uh, the, the problems that occur from human abuse, uh, operators that don't understand or maintenance people that, and I'm not cutting down on maintenance people, but maybe they don't understand the impact they're having on the motor when they excessively start it or they just do different things that they don't realize that they're causing damage. That's where education comes in. Most bearing failures, uh, can be prevented. They under lubrication or over lubrication. Um, there are so many conditions like that that we see almost every day, uh, but it can be prevented by teaching people not to put too much grease in or not putting enough grease in. Additional causes could be coupling misalignment, um, soft foot conditions, mixing incompatible greases, uh, applications with variable frequency drives and not taking care of the circulating currents that are generated by the drive. There are ways to handle that, uh, just different things like that. Example of an under lubricated machine or motor, you can see how hot and how dry it is. Believe it or not, we see this not every day, but very commonly still condition where we have over lubrication. That guy was really good at lubricating, but he lubricated so much that he caused damage in the other direction. Wipe sleeve bearing, just showing an example of a sleeve bearing and, a, and the failure of that bearing can be caused from contamination in the oil. Uh, a, a, a number of things can cause that. Um, broken shaft, in this case, excessive belt tension on both of these causing the roller bearing to fail roller bearing fails, generates all that heat, and then causes the heat in the shaft, and then the shaft breaks. Uh, this is an example of just losing a bearing and then the rotor touching off on the stator. In this example, we've got aluminum that transfer from the rotor to the stator. Not uncommon, not always a complete disaster. You can typically, believe it or not, clean that up, and or if it's a rewind, you rewind it do a core test, clean that iron up. It just depends on the magnitude of the failure. Uh, the rotor, on the other hand, depending on how bad the damage is, you might have to replace the rotor or, from my perspective, convert it to a copper alloy. Um, mechanical overload. So winding failures um, contribute 16 to 20%, and the leading cause is overload. The windings fail because the motors are get pushed harder and harder. And people see that service factor and they wanna push that motor into that service factor 
and they think they're okay, but they're creating more heat, and that heat then fails the lining prematurely. Um, again, service factors for intermittent short duty, it's not for continuous. We do have the opportunity sometimes to take a design like this and get it in, and if it's a rewind, we might be able to increase the copper cross-sectional area. We might be able to increase the class of insulation, let's say from F to H, and actually allow you now to run without redesigning it at a higher horsepower and get the same original life. But those are the things you look at and you work with your customer to determine, you know, is this something you need in that application? If you're gonna continually put it in an overload condition, or is it time to get a new motor that's rated and better for the application? Whoops, sorry. Starting and stopping, don't wanna really go past that. That's a tremendously stressful time on the motor. And amazingly, we will have failures that a motor will fail or trip, and the operator doesn't get with maintenance, and he immediately turns it back on. And then they do it again, and they could do it five, six, seven times. They finally get maintenance, this thing won't run well, they just now cause severe damage by hitting it over and over, causing tremendous heat. Um, that can be prevented and the extent of damage can be greatly prevented by teaching the operator to investigate why it tripped. Don't just automatically hit the button. It's human nature to hit the button, but uh, that isn't necessarily the best answer. Thermal damage on the left here just the picture showing just an overheated winding and then a typical grounded winding at the coil at the edge of the slot. The reason that happens and it's very consistently happens on grounds is the coils are designed in such a way that the coil exits the slot and then that diamond shape. Well, blocking and bracing helps, but when you start a motor, you have that high end rush current, that winding wants to move it wants to torque, it physically tries to move, and it will move if it isn't blocked and braced properly. So why you see a failure here consistently is because that's a fulcrum point. That's a point where the coil is being pulled and maybe eventually it causes a failure in the ground wall. Rotors account for five to eight percent. The, the failure on the left is showing a bar that's lifting, broke from the shoring ring. Crack shorting ring on the right, almost through the whole rotor. Um, again, typically only because of excessive starting and stopping. Bar ring to crack failure, and then a bar that's actually lifted. You'd be amazed at the number of motors that operate with bars that are lifted and they're dragging on the stator and they're operating that way. And, and the motor hasn't failed. Somebody hears something funny or vibration analysis picks it up and then the motors eventually shut down and they're lucky because typically that condition will cause a catastrophic failure. Conditions where the motor is externally or internally plugged and it's not allowing it to cool too much contamination. A paper mill, obviously on this side, totally closed fan cooled motor, but you took away the cooling mechanism. The cooling fan underneath this housing is designed to blow air across those ribs. Can't do it in this design. It's, it's completely insulated that the motor from being able to do that. So the motor's gonna get hot and fail. Same thing on the left, but internal contamination. 